الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صبغة الله ومن أحسن من الله صبغة ونحن له عابدون صدق الله العظيم إن شاء الله تعالى before the month of Ramadan we came up to right at ayah number 238 of Surah Al-Baqarah where we have been picking and choosing ayahs from the Quran from the start till the end that's basically our goal we're all going to be looking at the ayahs from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the things that you should do or things that you should refrain from so the qualities that are pointed out in other people or even among the believers that these are bad things, we even as believers would have to of course refrain from them. And things that we anywhere are doing that are good, we should continue to do that as an encouragement that this is basically how we should be living our life. So right after Ramadan, as we are coming out from the month of Ramadan, where we have been given this boot camp like living style, where we have lived our life on standards that we generally do not live our lives at. Praying on time, trying to make up all the salah within time, trying to come to the masjid, trying to be part of the congregation, building unity, building community, getting to see each other, communicate with each other, refraining from bad attitude, refraining from things that are considered to be bad for the inner soul, and also refraining from things that are bad for the body. So we were taking care of our spiritual life, inside and out. So the ayah that we are at right now, which is ayah number 238 of Surah Al-Baqarah, it's a beautiful ayah, which basically links us now with the month of Ramadan, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, حافظوا على الصلوات Guard your prayers. Guard. Now we understand the duty of a guard. If a guard sleeps, you will fire him. So as a believer, we have a duty to an extent that we have to guard it. It's not like, ah, it's okay to miss one prayer, that's fine. I prayed the other four. No. It's okay to delay it. I'll just wait and in the last five minutes. I'll pray this one. And then with the same wudu, I'll pray the other one. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, guard it. It's not like if you have to work from 9 to 5 and you show up at 4 p.m., what will the employer do to you? Or if you start coming to school late every day, half hour, two hours, three hours, whatever you feel like, where will you going to end up? Of course, in principal's office. And soon with the letter back to home. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, حَافِزُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاتِ الْوُسْطَى And the middle prayer. Now there's a difference of opinion on the middle prayer. If we consider the Salat al-Fajr to be the first prayer of the day, then Asr gets to be the middle prayer. If we think that from the Maghrib, the Islamic calendar date changes, then Fajr gets to be the middle prayer. Both opinions exist. And if you notice, both of these times are very hard on believers to come up and pray. Because Asr is when you have worked all day long and you're tired and you're trying to wrap up. Now at winter time it even gets tougher on you. And if you look at the Fajr time, it's also tough to get up. Because sometimes the Fajr is happening 3.30 and sometimes it's happening like 7 o'clock. And then you have to go back to sleep and then wake up again and everybody has their schedule to go to. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is important salah, because that really, really tests your grounds. وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ And for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't just be obedient, be devoutly obedient. You should have a devotion towards your faith. You know there are two kinds of employees, or there are two kinds of students, and when you go to school, there's a student who only reads or does homework to pass. That's all their goal is. I should pass. The other person passing 
is not the goal. Passing will come along. His vision or her vision is far more than that. Similarly, if you go to a workplace, there are two kinds of employees who just are looking at a clock at 4.30, well, I'm going to be 5 o'clock and I'm going to head out. And then there are others, even at 5 o'clock, they're very productive. And when they're driving back home, they're like brainstorming. Okay, this was the problem I ran into in work. How can I make this better? And then this guy who's running a convenience store, so is his friend. And now he's trying to figure out what could be a more efficient way to run the same store where I can increase my profits and I can decrease my overhead. So there are different places where you and I could be situated and we're devoted and then there are people who just slide through. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that devote yourself to your faith. Don't just do a passing. Try to do more than passing. In the next ayah, which I will be looking at, is ayah number 242. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens things. Opens. يُبَيِّنُ لَكُمْ What? آيَاتِهِ His signs. His ayahs. His message. Why? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So that you think. So thinking is the ground rule of this faith. Yes, there are places where the belief comes in. Then we say, yes, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ This is the book without a doubt. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ Those people who have believed without seeing. Because they believed in the messenger. They believed his words. They believe in the God. They believe in the Jannah. They believe in the Jahannam. They believe in the Day of Judgment. They believe in the angels. They believe in the jinn. Without seeing. That's a belief system. But then there is a life that you and I live over here that certainly reflects a thought process. If you look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you start reading his seerah, you will going to be like, Wow, he made such informed decisions on worldly affairs. He will ask the companions. He will ask, what do you think? He had a council. He had ministers. And the Prophet said, I have two ministers in heaven and two ministers on earth. The ministers in the heaven are Jibra'il and Mikail. The one on the earth are Abu Bakr and Umar. And even after that, the other companions did the same thing. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala and Sayyidina Abu Bakr would work like this with each other. Being the two ministers of the Prophet, they had to be extremely working together at the time of Abu Bakr. After the times of Abu Bakr, of course, Umar had this huge al-majlis al-shura, the prominent companions, which has the likes of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala and Sayyidina Uthman, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sayyidina Zubair, Sayyidina Talha, Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, prominent people, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, great people. And it reminds me of a little thing that at the time of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, you know it was a time of munafiqeen too, who were trying to play games. And one of them approached Hazrat Sayyidina Ali and said, You know what, at the time of Uthman and Umar and Abu Bakr, we were all constantly expanding. But it, when, it, when it came to your time, it looks like we're sort of kind of locked in this little map that we have. We're trying to maintain it. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said, You know, at the time of Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman, they had ministers like me. And at my time, I have to deal with ministers like you. So how can we expect to expand when I have to deal with people like you? Who don't think other than fasad. They just want to quarrel among themselves. So how are we supposed to grow? That's exactly the ground rule and principle on which communities are built. Smaller community. When Prophet Muhammad moved into the Medina, he noticed there are three kinds of people very prominent. Believers, idol worshippers, and the people of the book. Following different ways. And if you leave them the way they are, 
The people of Medina have always fought with each other. There were two prominent tribes. There were other tribes too. Aus and Khazraj. They had their own allies from the people of the book. And they were constantly going in battle with each other. So there must be a common ground on which everybody could be brought together to so establish the constitution in the state of Medina. So that constitution brought everybody on the common grounds. In business dealing, in social dealings, in the norms, in the freedom of religion. You name it, it was there. In that short paragraph or those smaller set of points, everything was stated. Common enemies will help each other out. We're not going to fight with each other. A lot of these things were there. Why? To maintain the harmony in the state. Because if the capital has turmoil, how will the empire work? So it's extremely important to bring peace. Exactly the same way, if we are fighting with each other in the masjid, how are we supposed to grow as a community? So that basically is the ground rule that unity is very important in all walks of life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ Please think. Think. Make informed decisions. If you look at the battlefield, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not just walk into a battlefield and say, okay, let's fight. No. Very strategically planned. Even if you pick the map and the locations of the Battle of Uhud, where the Muslims had lost a lot of people, you will notice that if these bunch of archers would not have made a mistake, this was the perfect setup. In these times, the military generals have studied the map, and they said this is the perfect setup to defeat an enemy when you're smaller in number. So if that mistake would not have been done, strategically there was nothing that went wrong. Look, you look at the battle of, that was fought against the Banu Hawazin. You look at the battle that was fought against any people, you will find strategy. Everything was strategized. Of course, there was help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is there in all walks of life with everybody. And from there to here, you cannot even walk and pray if there is no help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why when we say, Hayya ala salah, hayya ala falah, when you say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. I cannot make my next move without the, without the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If He doesn't give me power, nothing can be done. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to use our heads. Now that was the salah part coming out of the Ramadan. Let's look at the next ayah. Ayah number 245 from Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا Who among you is willing to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a loan? A beautiful loan. Now why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need loan? The idea is that you spread what you have among the people around you for the greater good, for uplifting the society. It shouldn't be like this, that the 5% of the people are controlling the lives of the 95% of the people. And the economic growth is stagnant. There is a division in society to an extent where rich people are just getting richer and poor people are striving to even make two meals a day. So there should be a distribution of wealth. And zakat is made mandatory only, only so that, you know, there is a way for those people who can't otherwise do it, can do it. But for the people who have abundance, should be doing it a lot often than just relying on solely on zakat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that go ahead, do this, this will benefit you. And then, فَيُضَعِفَهُ لَهُ أَضْعَافًا كَثِيرًا do not worry about that your money is reducing. Your money is not reducing. It is growing. Now think about it. What happens after a tax return? When the tax return comes back, there is for the next couple months or so, the, the, there is an economic rise in spending. People have this at the back of their mind. When my tax return comes, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to buy that. So all of this money is poured back to the market, which in a result creates employment. And those employment in return, as they get the money, they give it to other people, 
so that they can actually get their ball rolling. So there's a whole cycle, economic cycle that starts. So when you give out money, the people that you're giving out money to, they will not going to hold on to it because they don't have anything else. They will rather spend it. And you never know, the money may circulate back to you. So for example, if you are a gas station owner and you give a dollar out and somebody comes back with a dollar and buy the soda from you, you don't charge a dollar for the soda. You charge two dollars. You get 200% profit out of this guy. So if this person didn't have the two dollars, he would even have walked into your gas station to buy the soda. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you don't worry about it. You spend. It's my responsibility to give you many fold. And notice, وَاللَّهُ يَقْبِضُ وَيَبْسُطُ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ It is Allah who sometimes give you so much. And it is Allah who sometimes hold it. And notice, at the end of the day, it is only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you all have to return. That's the bottom line. That when we leave, everything is left behind except for the good deeds, except for the good kids who pray for us after we are gone. So think about it, if these kids are not standing on the founding principles of Islam, if they do not know the basics of the deen, how can we expect them to say dua for us when we are not even here around? Graves don't exist more than X number of years. But it is the good deeds that follow. Or even if your lifetime or even after you, if your kids spend something in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with an intention that Allah give reward to so and so. Or if you did something in your life that is growing exponentially, it will help even if when we are gone. For example, taking care of an orphan and making them to an extent where they can make their livelihood and living. So for their life and for their generations to come, you are getting part of the reward because you were there in their success. Teaching somebody to read Quran, as long as that knowledge through that route continues to grow, you're getting reward out of it. So there are a lot of things we can do as individuals that will benefit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling that everything over here on the outside will be here on the outside, but you won't be around. Everything has to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember, what you are spending is not yours. Whatever we give to them, out of that they spend. It's not theirs to start with. So what are they so boastful about? It was never theirs. In the next ayah, which is ayah number 256 of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا إكراه في الدين. There's no compulsion in religion. There's no forcing. If it was about force, then the Muslims in the earlier times, at the time of the Prophet, would have forced people. Would have forced, but they never did. There was no forcing. لا إكراه في الدين. قد تبين الرشد من الغيب. The guidance. Is open. Everybody should know. This is how the guidance is. This is what the guidance is. And this is what the guidance is not. It doesn't matter how beautiful this looks, which is not guidance. It is not guidance. You may like it. But عَسَى أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْءًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ There are things that you may not like, but they're good for you. وَعَسَى أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْءًا وَهُوَ شَيْءٌ